Hello and welcome to this session of Maritime Medicine in which we discuss poisonings. By the end of this session, you'll be able to describe initial management of an overdose patient, identify signs and symptoms, and treat the following overdoses. Opiates, benzodiazepines, tricyclic antidepressants, anticholinergic agents like diphenhydramine or Benadryl, carbon monoxide, acetaminophen, and stimulants. When we're talking about overdoses and poisoning, we're differentiating this from hazardous materials incidents. Those are discussed separately. And we do that because this is generally a different scale, generally different toxic exposures, although there is some overlap, chlorine gas, carbon monoxide, for example. And generally, we're only talking about a single patient, and their primary issue is the toxicologic emergency. In hazmat incidents, most morbidity and mortality comes from associated trauma. In these incidents, the injury and the death comes from the toxin itself. And these can be accidental or intentional exposures, and if they're intentional, it can be a suicide attempt or a homicide attempt. Regardless, you always have to remember scene safety, particularly talking about carbon monoxide, but even some toxic overdoses can make for an unsafe scene. Now one of the really great things about these sort of toxicologic emergencies is that for the most part your care is supportive care. There's very few exposures that have specific antidotes. So generally X, A, B, C, D, E, F will get you through almost any toxicologic emergencies and we'll, we'll talk about where there's some differences but for the most part that's really going to be the key. Respiratory support, circulatory support with IV fluids and possibly CPR there's very little role for detoxification. You may be ordered to give activated charcoal. That's very common. The, the idea is that if you drink this charcoal, it chases down whatever you ingested and it helps absorb it. There's not a lot of great evidence for it. There's, and there's a lot of issues with it because if a patient becomes unresponsive and vomits and aspirates, it can be tremendously damaging to the lungs. So there may be a few exceptional cases where it's a toxin that we don't have any good treatment for and the patient isn't going to become unresponsive. But for the most part, there's really nothing you're going to give. And, and syrup of Epicac was taken off the market in the U.S. There's really no role for medications that make people vomit anymore. That's a, that is an older practice that's dangerous and not effective. So a lot of figuring out what happened is going to come from getting a good history from the patient and so the patient is your best source if they're conscious they can tell you what happened and what the exposure was and whether it was accidental or intentional and if there was a poly substance ingestion because often with suicide attempts alcohol is ingested at the same time and then if you really can't sort that out finding the clues putting on your deerstalker hat and playing Sherlock Holmes is critical you look for pill bottles you look for other affected people, which would suggest something like carbon monoxide or chlorine exposure, and clues on the scene which give you a sense of what it is that's happened. All right, so we'll start by discussing opiates. And this is morphine and its derivatives, uh, basically either natural or synthetic derivatives from extract from the poppy plant. And oh opium, morphine, the opiates are central nervous system and respiratory and cardiovascular depressants. So they make you sleepy, they slow down your heart rate, they drop your blood pressure, they make your breathing slow down. And people will present with a decreased level of consciousness and respiratory rate. They may have a low blood pressure. Depending on how they're shooting up, they may have track marks that you can see, which are injection site marks, and I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, they may also hide their injections. Uh, they may be injecting under their tongue or under their nails or between their toes. And it may be very hard to find the track marks. Their pupils will be constricted and called pinpoint pupils. The treatment is to just awaken them enough so that they're breathing on their own. You don't want to take away their high all at once. You don't want to give them a big dose of the, medic of the reversal medication, naloxone, because they'll come up fighting and if they're on certain types of opiates, it, you may put them into sudden severe withdrawal that's very hard to reverse, and that's a misery to manage. If you need to support their breathing, you can. And then the medication you give is naloxone. 
and at 0.1 milligram at a time. Give them very small doses, up to a 2 milligram dose, and you may have to do this again and again and again depending on how much they overdosed on. And you can give it IV or intramuscular or even intranasal if you have these small devices that let you spray it up their nose. You do need to rule out the mimics. Check a blood sugar, make sure they're not hypoglycemic, make sure there's no evidence of trauma with a head injury, and make sure that you don't think they overdosed on anything else. And generally, seeing clues in the history will tell you what it was that they used. And if you don't know, it's certainly not going to hurt them to give them the naloxone, so you can give that to them if you have any suspicion at all. So on the top, you see someone with constricted pupils. On the left, you see scene clues, drug paraphernalia, syringes, medications that people are using to shoot up. Um, and people will crush pills and shoot up things that were never meant to be injected and get big infections from these. And then you look on that picture on the right, on the bottom there, and you can see track marks, spots where they've been injecting again and again and again, and the, the veins are all beaten up. Benzodiazepines, things like Valium or Xanax, um, Midazolam, Lorazepam, uh, all of these types of medications work on the same receptor as alcohol, and they're used as an anti-anxiety medication and a sleep aid, and they're relatively safe. It's, it's hard for people to kill themselves on an isolated benzodiazepine overdose. You, you really can't take enough before you fall asleep. The problem is, is that they're never isolated. People wash them down with alcohol for the most part, and that combination can be lethal. They'll also overdose on other medicines with them as well. So your presentation is someone with altered mental status, respiratory depression, hypotension, and a flaccid body. And it, unless you know what they did, it's going to be very hard to figure this out and to differentiate it from other causes of altered mental status. So the treatment is supportive, X, A, B, C, D, E, F. If you do that, control exsanguinating hemorrhage, manage the airway, manage breathing, manage the circulation, do a neurologic status, expose them to look for clues and then protect them from the environment and find scene clues. If you do that on every patient who's critically ill or unresponsive, regardless of the cause, you are doing the right initial treatment. So that should be your mantra, X, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then provide supportive care and you'll need to evacuate these patients. Tricyclic antidepressants are very powerful antidepressants. They fell out of favor for a while because they're so toxic. Um, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SRI or SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and these other various snaries and other types of antidepressants are much safer, but they aren't always effective. And so the tricyclics are coming back into favor for people with with depression that doesn't respond to other therapies and they're also used to help people sleep and they can be used to help with bedwetting so there's a lot of other indications there's a lot of these out there and people who are depressed who have these very commonly overdose on them and they often die and no matter how much we do for them the presentation will be altered mental status low blood pressure high heart rate dry skin and seizures and if you've got that and you've got the right context for an overdose, it's a tricyclic antidepressant overdose. Unfortunately, we don't have any great care for it. X, A, B, C, D, E, F, support them. IV fluids, normal saline, uh, tricyclic antidepressants actually work as something called sodium channel blockers. And the sodium in normal saline is somewhat helpful in fixing the problem, uh, although we, we tend to use other versions of, of uh, sodium in the emergency department, but still, that's the best you're going to have available, so you can give that. And then if they start to have seizures, benzodiazepines. Diphenhydramine or Benadryl and all of its friends, the cough medications, the over-the-counter sleep aids, all of those variants cause what are called anticholinergic symptoms. Um, and actually, Jimson weed can also do this. The presentation is pretty straightforward. They're red as a beet, hot as a hair, dry as a bone, and mad as a hatter. What does that mean? They're flushed and red. Their body is hot, it's dry, they're not sweating. When someone overdoses on cocaine or one of the other so-called sympathomimetics, they get really sweaty. It's just like if you released a lot of epinephrine. Well, these people aren't getting really sweaty, and that's a way to differentiate them between the, those, these people and the people who've overdosed on other stimulants. And they're crazy. They have altered mental status. They're having hallucinations. They are truly bizarre. Treatment is XABCDEF a lot of IV fluids,
And then benzodiazepines are very useful for controlling the delirium and also for controlling the seizures that they're going to develop. So carbon monoxide poisoning is one of those fairly problematic ones because while it is often an individual event, it can also be a much larger hazardous materials event requiring not just individual intervention, but management of the entirety of the event, the scene. So carbon monoxide is a byproduct of incomplete combustion. If you completely combust a carbohydrate, you get carbon dioxide. If you don't completely combust it, you just get carbon monoxide. And so typically we're going to see that in exhaust and anywhere there's a fire that they're smoldering. Now, catalytic converters actually convert carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide. And so it would take about 24 to 48 hours of a car parked in a garage with the engine running to develop enough carbon monoxide to be toxic. But many engines don't have catalytic converters, so that exhaust does contain a fair amount of carbon monoxide. The typical presentation is if there were multiple people exposed, you'll have multiple ill individuals. There'll be headaches and vomiting. They'll feel weak. They may feel short of breath and have some chest pain, confusion, coma if it's severe, and pale skin. And what happens with carbon monoxide is it's drawn in through your lungs, just like breathing any other gas, and it looks a lot like oxygen, which is O2, two oxygen molecules together. Carbon monoxide looks to your hemoglobin just like oxygen, and in fact, it binds even more strongly to your hemoglobin than oxygen does, and so it outcompetes oxygen and binds to the hemoglobin. So the treatment for it is to put so much oxygen in that it outcompetes the carbon monoxide. So X, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then oxygen. High flow oxygen, non rebreather, 15 liters per minute. If you have a demand valve system, and a lot of ships will have those, it's basically an oxygen mask with a little adapter on it that gives them oxygen when they breathe in. That delivers absolutely 100% oxygen. Use that. And if they have severe symptoms, they're confused, they're comatose, they have chest pain, a severe shortness of breath, they're pregnant, then they need to be evacuated to a hyperbaric chamber. If you're able to completely clear their symptoms with inhaled oxygen, talk to medical control. As long as the threat's gone of repeated exposure, they may very well not need any evacuation at all, just shipboard management, because unless there's severe symptoms, all we do in an emergency department is give oxygen until the symptoms clear. Acetaminophen overdose is very common. This is Tylenol and other Tylenol or acetaminophen containing products. It's very, very toxic in overdose. And, and most countries that are not the United States limit the amount that you can buy at a time to try to limit the to toxicity. More than four grams a day in an adult is a toxic dose. And that's eight extra strength Tylenol. And if you combine that with all the cold and cough and flu remedies that contain acetaminophen, then you can see how people can very quickly get to a toxic state. And if you mix it with alcohol, even lower doses can be toxic. And so if someone's trying to kill themselves and they take both acetaminophen and alcohol, or someone's drinking a lot and decides they want to take a bunch of Tylenol for a headache, they can very quickly get liver failure. So initially when people overdose, they're asymptomatic. And then over the next few days, the liver gets damaged. And that's the toxicity of acetaminophen. And so liver failure symptoms show up. The skin turns yellow. They get swollen. Their belly swells. That's called ascites as fluid leaks into the abdomen. The whites of the eyes turn yellow. That's scleral icterus. And because the liver is responsible for making, um, making all the proteins that help your blood to clot, your blood doesn't clot well. You get a lot of bruising. You get those petechiae, those little red dots that don't blanch or turn white when you push on them. So... That shows up, that's bad. So if they're asymptomatic, talk to medical control and you're gonna calculate how much exposure there is. And if it's a, su a sufficient exposure, you're in the probable toxic range, they'll need evacuation for monitoring and for the antidote, which you don't have, but it's N-acetylcysteine um, is the medication that's used. If they're symptomatic, so they've got liver failure symptoms, X, A, B, C, D, E, F, and they may have some bleeding because they don't clot well, uh, 
from the, the liver damage, so you may need to control that. Give them supportive care and evacuate them. Now, the good thing about an acetaminophen overdose is if they survive, they tend to have a complete recovery, including a complete recovery of the liver. Um, but if they don't, they end up with a liver transplant or was, was more common um, when I was a medical student. I did a rotation in Pittsburgh in the liver transplant ICU, and we would get transfers of severe Tylenol, acetaminophen overdoses and liver failure, and more often than not, they died. Stimulants are common drugs of abuse. Um, they're typically not taken for suicide reasons, but they're taken for recreational purposes and people may overdose on them. So cocaine, too much caffeine, methamphetamine, the cathinones and synthetic cathinones like bath salts, ecstasy or molly, the pure form, and other stimulants all essentially work the same way. They, they rev you up mentally and physically. They're, they're stimulants. So the presentation will be based on how much stimulation there is and the drug itself. In uh, our emergency department experience with bath salts, the synthetic cathinones, what we found was that patients presented with different degrees of agitation and different degrees of psychosis and different degrees of stimulation, physical stimulation, uh, seizures, high temperatures, depending on which particular type of bath salt it was. So it'll really vary. But in general, they'll all have altered mental status. And typically, it's more than just being high, because if they were just high, you probably wouldn't find out about it. It wouldn't be a medical emergency un unless somebody stumbled in on them. Um, so they are very confused. They may be psychotic, having hallucinations. Their heart rate and blood pressure will be up because this is like releasing a lot of adrenaline into the body. Their body temperature will go up. And in the most severe cases of what's called excited delirium that we saw in our emergency department, we saw temperatures above 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and those patients all died. And they may be having seizures. So the treatment is X, A, B, C, D, E, F, ventilate them, start an IV, support their, blo their blood pressure if it crashes, and then cool them down, try to get them back to a normal body. Now, there are many other toxic exposures that can occur. And really the key thing to remember is that as long as you do X, A, B, C, D, E, F, you control bleeding if there is any, you manage the airway, breathing, and circulation, you assess them neurologically, you expose them and make sure there are no other injuries, nothing else going on, and you find the clues, you will take care of them. You don't know what's going on initially with these patients. Oftentimes, overdoses and other toxicologic patients come into the emergency department, and for the first hour or two hours, we don't know what happened. We don't know what the substance was. Sometimes we don't even know there was an overdose, but it doesn't matter. We resuscitate them the same way. Generally, they're going to need IV fluids. If they have seizures, they need benzodiazepines. Get medical control involved early. You're going to need them to give the fluids and to give the, the midazolam or the diazepam or whatever you use for the seizures anyway. But get them involved early and talk about evacuation early. Generally speaking, unless it's something like carbon monoxide and you fix them or a non-toxic acetaminophen overdose, you're going to have to evacuate these patients. So get that process started early. Please complete any associated knowledge review and... If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact your instructor or your professor. Thanks very much.